Hello and welcome to Inside the Therapy Room. I'm your host, Sam Sellers. I'm a registered therapist, a wife and a fur mama, and I am passionate about breaking down the barriers and stigma attached to therapy. I want to begin by honouring the traditional custodians of the land we live and work on. Today, Tasha is on Yugara land and Sam is on Gundungurra land. We pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the memories, the traditions and cultures of our First Nations people. We must always remember that the land below our feet is, was and always will be Aboriginal land. Today we're chatting to Tasha Turner. Tasha is a queer neurodivergent counsellor, advocate, wife and chronic pain battler. Many of her clients are neurodivergent, mainly with autism and or ADHD, and are part of the LGBTQIA community. Tasha uses her lived experience to work with these individuals to connect on a deeper level as someone who understands many of the struggles and triumphs that are faced. Today, we're going to be specifically focusing on transgender and gender diverse folk. Listen in to hear Tasha explain the broad terminology used and how complex it can be even from within the community. Tasha shares what it is like for trans and gender diverse people inside the therapy room, including the privilege she has of witnessing people's progressions towards their most authentic self. And as always, we are smashing more myths. And this time, Tasha is smashing one around gender transitioning. We hope you enjoy joining us inside the therapy room. Welcome, Tasha. How's your day been? Thank you. Yeah, good. Thank you. Amazing. It's good. We're recording on a Monday, so it's nice to start the week nice and easy. Tasha is here with us and we are going to chat about a really wonderful and necessary conversation to have at the moment. Um, You are a queer neurodivergent counsellor, correct? I am, yeah. Yep. And whilst you work with a number of niches around, you know, neurodivergence, chronic illness, trauma, all of those sorts of things, um, we are going to focus on transgender and gender diverse folk, which is going to be a great chat. Great. Amazing. So tell me a little bit about, I guess, who might fit into that category or what does that mean for people who are not used to the terminology or perhaps don't have a lot of understanding what fits into that category of trans and gender diverse and that's a really good question because it's it's not as straightforward as it might seem and as many people know even in my community we have so many so many names so many boxes so many labels that are changing all the time so um two big words transgender and cisgender Cisgender is when when you're born and there's a gender put in your birth certificate and as you grow up, you th- you feel aligned with that gender. It's like you've got female on the certificate and you feel female. Great. Bingo. Cisgender. Yep. Transgender is when the a gender on your birth certificate doesn't feel like the person you know you are inside, right? So that's transgender. Mm-hmm. Another term is gender diverse, which is quite interchangeable in the community with transgender. It's like a whole spectrum. So it's this big umbrella. Some people don't want to identify with trans because they think in their brain it means going from one point to another. It actually doesn't. So it just depends um, on the person. But when we're looking at that community, I say to people, right, if you don't feel aligned with the gender on your birth certificate, well, you're in this community. So I see everyone who falls into that area. Amazing. And there is a section in that gender diversity um, for those who perhaps don't identify with either gender, correct? Yes, like me. So I'm openly genderqueer. Mm -hmm. Um, That means that for me, because not every genderqueer person has the same like expression. For me, my gender can move around. I have some some days I have male and female. Some days it's more male, less females. Some days it's opposite. Some days it's nothing in particular. 
And then you have similar, you'll have non-binary where people don't identify with a gender. You'll have people who are gender fluid. So they will feel one day that they're mainly one gender and then it will move. So it's, again, you can ask each person in that category and they might explain it differently to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. And speaking of asking, another wonderful thing to be asking is people's pronouns. Tell us about pronouns and why they're important and, I mean, why people tend to kick up a bit of a stink about pronouns. (laughs) Yeah. And it can be confusing. Yeah. Because when you're cisgender, you know, you use the pronouns that match the gender on your birth certificate. Yeah. When you're transgender, some people decide that they don't want to have different pronouns because it's a personal choice. Mm-hmm. Some people feel very much, no, I need the, the pronoun that matches the gender inside. Mm-hmm. And it's very uncomfortable when you feel, so for example, I'm what they call assigned female at birth. Right. So um, if I felt uncomfortable with somebody using she, her, every time they use she, her, it means that even if I've explained that my gender is different, then they're not listening to me. And it's a bit like it's it's very disrespectful. And for many of us, we can understand it's not easy for somebody else to change the pronoun. But when you have it again and again and again, you might have someone who gets what we call misgendered yeah. 20, 30 times a day. So by that point, we're a little bit over it. Or if we keep asking someone and then they just keep, they don't even try. So that's why that's why we get upset because it physically feels uncomfortable. And then when someone doesn't try, then it feels like you don't even respect me, you don't believe me. So it's just, they're small words that mean a lot. Yeah. I think um, for me who, you know, does not have that problem, I identify with the pronouns that assign with my gender. I can only imagine the level of exhaustion and mental draining that it would take a toll on on that individual to just be continually disrespected. And to be quite frank, I just think it's common human decency to just you know, my name is Sam. I expect people to call me Sam. You know, it's just sort of that basic human decency of of another person. Um, but I think it's really ironic. It's just one of those really funny things in the sense that those people who say, um, you know, pronouns don't exist or we don't need to worry about pronouns and things like that. It's ironic because if we started to call them using different pronouns that assigned their gender, they would suddenly have a problem with it. So, you know, yes. those who identify with those pronouns still want them to be used. They have preferred pronouns. So it's one of those really ironic, funny things that is just like, oh, come on, guys. It's just, you know, just basic respect here. So I agree. Yeah. 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 Um, now, before we sort of dive in a bit deeper, you have the trans flag behind you, correct? I do. Yes, Wonderful, I do. Beautiful pink, blue and white. Can you tell us a little yeah. bit about what the flag means? Oh, now I may get this not exactly correct. That's okay. <laughs> I put you on the spot so, here a little bit. Sorry. I have, yeah, yeah. And I forget because <laughs> there's so many flags. Yes. So the, the blue is obviously represents the male gender. The pink represents the female gender and the white is sort of whatever gender in between, right? Or no gender. Now, I may be wrong about the white, so we might have to check the white. But I seem seem to remember. But like I said, there's so many. There's a gender queer flag. There's a non-binary flag. So um, so I'm probably going to get my whole community upset. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it is okay if anybody is out there listening and has a different idea of Sorry. what the trans flag means um please let us know and we will i will put a post up on my social media um because th- you're right there is a lot of flags there's a lot of terminology and i don't think we can expect anybody to to have all of the information all of the time um but I am probably going to put you on the spot here again in a little bit because there is a subsection of gender diverse um, called intersex. Can you sort of 
just a brief definition of what that is because I think it, a yeah. lot of people get confused around that. Yeah, yeah, because like you said, it's about sex, yeah, not gender. Yes. So um, there's there's biological sex, which is related to um, your your genitals and your internal workings, right? There's gender, which is the um, gender you feel inside which sometimes matches the outside. And then there's sexuality, which is basically who you're attracted to and want to have sex with. Yeah. So intersex is not intersex is in the LGBTIQA plus acronym. And yet intersex is not included in the transgender umbrella because it's not about gender. So intersex people um, have lots of different combinations of chromosomes. Yeah. And some of them are gender diverse as well and some of them have diverse sexualities so it's really quite complicated and for lots of intersex people it's hard because they often feel they don't belong anywhere like it's like there's so much stigma around being intersex and it's so hard to be included even in the lgbtiqa plus acronym Mm -hmm. so there are you know portions of our community that aren't always supportive of each other Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it is um, part of the conversation is that gender and sex get confused so often. Um, and I think people just, you know, need to think that gender is about expression, not about body parts. And but I think it is, um, e- like you said, even within the community, there is still a lot of division and and things like that. So I think you know, people automatically think if you're a part of the queer community or the LGBTQIA plus community that there is a lot of camaraderie and yes, there is, but there is still a lot of division as well. And a lot of, you know, confusion around, you know, language and terminology and experience and things like that. So, so tell me a little bit about what led you, I guess, to be passionate about this area of the community. Uh, it's, it's my community yep. to start off with. So um, I'm genderqueer. My mm-hmm. wife is binary transgender. So that means that she identifies as female and, and has fully transitioned. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've been living this life before I was a therapist anyway. And I was an advocate and an activist in the community for quite some time. Um, and then part of my journey was becoming a therapist and realizing hey, there's this huge hole, which I already knew anyway, but there's this huge hole of specific mental health support for the trans community because many of us will, this is another reason why I'm openly queer, because I love being queer anyway, but we will only open up to people in our community. You can imagine if you're talking to somebody about hormones, and I talk to people about probably the most personal aspect of who you are, then how do you know who to talk to? How do you know how much how much they know? So I love working in this area because I follow people throughout their journey. I get to see people become who they're really meant to be. I get to be involved in really personal parts of that. And it's yeah. such a privilege. And it's so, for me, it's like, it's so beautiful to see them grow, you know, and I'm like, wow, that's, it means a lot to me. So I'm very passionate about it. I think beautiful is the terminology that came to my mind because, you know, as, despite the the pain and uh, that may come with that journey, it would be a beautiful experience to see, I guess, the progression and, you yeah. know, from, from beginning to middle to, to the present day. Um, I don't want to say end because it's not necessarily an end, but, um, yeah. you know, that it's, yeah, I think beautiful is the only word that I can think of to sort of yeah. see that, see that progression and see someone sort of become their most authentic self is a really, I mean, that's what we all sort of want out of this process. That's what all therapists want is people to yeah. be able to be their most authentic self and to feel safe to be that person. So um, yeah, yeah, I think that's wonderful. Tell me a little bit about if uh, those who are listening who are either trans or, trans or gender diverse, tell me a little bit about what it might be like for those people inside the therapy room. 
uh, the first appointment, as we know, with most therapy is completely nerve wracking. It's yeah. terrible. Terrifying. Often. It's like <laughs> terrifying because especially for the, the trans person who is, often isn't quite sure where they're at with their gender. It's I don't know who this person is. I'm going to go in and I'm going to say something out loud that I might have squashed for years. And then and then and then what? Then I have to do something about it. And then what does it mean? And then what if they don't believe me? And then what are they going to say? So it's it's really stressful, which is another reason why um, I'm open about my gender and my wife's gender. So everyone knows, right, like it's a very safe space. My clinic is covered in trans flags, rainbow flags. So they know before they come in, you're safe here. Um, and then what happens generally in the first appointment, first few, I get to understand where are you on this journey? Because people come in at lots of different points, you know, and um, if it's right at the beginning, I always emphasize with people just because I love being queen, it doesn't mean you come in, you express something and I go, oh, right, yes, you're definitely over here and this is your path. Yeah. But don't do that at all. I slow them down often and go, let's just, Let's just explore. It's like going on this journey with someone. It's like, what does this mean? What doesn't this mean? Tell me about this. And what about this? And so it's really getting literally in their head, yeah. right? For and, and then following, like you said before, the journey. And that can be, at times, terrible, yeah. right, for the, for the client. Because often the, the, the pain, the discrimination, um, yeah. which you know, can be really, really awful. And as we both know, the suicide statistics for trans people is the highest in the LGBTIQA plus group. And that's because of what we have to deal with in society. It's not because we're depressed because we're trans. We're depressed because society can't deal with it. So sometimes it's it's heartbreaking. And I'm someone who does get really um, connected with my client. So if... You know, if they're going through something, part of me goes through that. Yeah. And then also part of me goes through it when, like you said before, when they're living their authentic self yeah. and they sometimes they'll come back to me a few years later and be like, hey, I just wanted to like drop in and let you know what's happening. And sometimes I cry mm. because like they've become this amazing person. So it, and I never know how the journey is going to develop. So it's really lovely to go along that and it like I said it can be exciting um often I'll support the family members too or the partner because that's hard mm -hmm. to support people and understanding the community so and also as someone if they take hormones and transition that's not a walk in the park no that's, I would imagine not. big no so there's a lot of preparation for that um so that's my short answer. <laughs> I would imagine that there is probably a much longer answer. Um, yeah. But I think, you know, as you sort of mentioned that sometimes clients come back. One of my most favourite things is when a client who you've finished with might email you a couple of years later and just saying, hey, just checking in, just letting you know I'm doing really well. Thanks for everything. And it's just yeah. one of those really yeah. sort of heartwarming yeah. moments to go, you know, not I was able to help that person, but I was able to witness that person become who they wanted to be and who they felt yeah. they should be. So it's one of those really wonderful moments. Um, but I would imagine you sort of mentioned support networks and things like that, that that's a whole sort of um, another level of support that's needed because it's not just about support. There is an education aspect to it as well, I would imagine, not just education about the community, but medical education if they are going through a mm -hmm. you know, the hormonal transfer, trans, what's the word, transition. I was like, what is that word that is not coming out of my <laughs> mouth? Um, like the hormonal transition mm -hmm. and a physical transition. So I would imagine that there's a lot of education, psychoeducation that's happening in those sessions yeah. as well, not necessarily just yeah. conversational talk therapy. No, it's there's there's so many levels yeah. because um for many people going to a gender clinic, which are in the main like capitals, yeah. there's a huge waiting list because I live rural in rural Queensland, I support people 
all over. And I don't, like you said, just just explore where they're at on their like gender journey. I'll get people contacting me and it's like, okay, there's this symptom happening, you know, with my hormones. Like can so there's a kind of biological support. I don't take yeah. the place of the doctor, but I'd be like, okay, this is completely normal, or hang on a minute, I'm a bit concerned about that. Maybe you should reach out to the prescriber. And then often I'll help them as well. If they've had surgery, I'll help them after surgery. Yeah. Because um when you're talking about people's genitals for a lot of surgery, like the, <laughs> there's no too much information, yeah. you know. Yeah. So they'll reach out to me and go, um, there's this thing happening. And um, I'm embarrassed and I don't actually know. And I'm like, it's okay, it's okay, it's fine. Let's talk yeah. through that. So, yeah, it's it's so much more than talk yeah. therapy. Yeah. We've got a nothing off limits um, mm. mentality here. <laughs> yeah, no, um, no. But I think it's important for, you know, for people to know that there is that level of support around, you know, medical yeah. stuff as well because I think, even, you know, just anything, we automatically think that we only can talk to our medical team about those things. Um, yeah. And a lot of the time our medical teams just want to know if there's any side effects or if things are improving and and the medical stuff, so to speak. And so there's a whole emotional side connected with our body um, and with medical stuff. So I think, you know, it's important for you, not just trans and gender diverse folk, but their families mm. and their friends and their partners to know, yeah. hey, I can go to therapy and talk about the the medical stuff that's going on with such and such. So, yeah. you know, I think that's a, a really important thing because uh, mm. I would suspect that there are people who would not think that they would be able to do that, that therapy is just about emotion or something like yeah. that. Yeah, so, and I, I do make that clear when yeah. I see trans people because I know if they have to wait several months yeah. to have another appointment with their gender clinic I'm like look I do know a lot about hormones I know a lot yeah. about surgery so you can ask me and if I don't have the answer then I'll tell you to talk to somebody else yeah. but yeah it's making it clear that that is part of it too yeah now I asked you in advance what is what are some things that you might want people to know about this community about or what might you want this community to know about therapy oh that's a very interesting question um so what i'd like them to know about therapy for a lot of us in the trans community we are petrified of therapy so people focus on the biological part yeah it's well if i want to take hormones or have surgery then i'll see my doctor for that but i don't need any mental health support because as soon as i do that then all my dysphoria, which is all the, the pain around transition, that will go away. That would be nice. That doesn't happen. So I'm often here to go, you're probably going to need some support with that. Yeah. And probably yeah. before you hit the wall. So in the trans community, I would like people to think that when they're reaching out about medical support, then it would be an idea to engage with a mental health therapist as well. Right. So that, you know, we talk we don't talk the community outside our community talks a lot about detransitioning so there's this myth right that it happens more than it does now often when you drill down into that people who have detransitioned didn't have mental health therapy beforehand or had like one or two sessions and it was a tick flick thing yeah. so this is another reason why it's so important right and i'll also say to people i'm not here to tell you what your gender is mm. it's not you come in and you describe something and I go oh no you're wrong it's over here yeah. so that's not what therapy is about either so it's kind of clarifying what I'm here for is to help you along the journey and help you understand who you are because yeah. lots of the time people aren't confused about their gender like they know I'm like, internally what their gender is they're fi having it but oh, now I'm stuttering. They're finding <laughs> it hard to express it. Yeah. Right. So that's another short answer. I hope that's helped. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it is, like you said, it's, it's, they know their gender often. It's about fear and grief and other people's opinions and all of the external world that often yeah. is pr suppressing their, their gender. 
Um, and so, yeah, I think it is, it's important for people. I think anybody who is, who, whether they are going to go through the medical system with their transition, because, um, you know, we haven't mentioned, but not everybody who identifies as trans goes through a gender medical transition, but, um, anybody who is going through that to have that mental support um, and emotional support alongside it um, and for their support network to also be involved in that process so that it becomes a network and, you know, a collaborative holding, if you speak, of this individual whilst they're going through what is probably going to be one of the most exhilarating and terrifying journeys of their life at the same time. So, yeah. Yeah. And also something I didn't mention um, is that people don't realise that a lot of the gender clinics near me or even a bit further away, they know who I am. So I work in conjunction with the prescriber. The endocrinologists know me. So that means that I'm I'm part of the team. I don't get in the way, but often the client will think, oh, hang on, if I reach out to my mental health therapist, they're like separate no, I'm not. Yeah. Right? So there is a transfer of information between us. Um, so just because I'm out in the middle of nowhere in the middle of rural Australia, in like <laughs> I am still connected to people. Yeah. Um, and then I was going to say something else, but I forgot. That's okay. It might come to you. <laughs> Um, you mentioned the word myth, and it's one. It's probably one of the last things that we'll we'll chat about. But I asked you to have a bit of a think about a myth that you would love to smash. What is that? Yeah, and that was hard because I have like a, like twenty. <laughs> There's so many, right? <laughs> this is like Tash gets her chance to have a rant. Yes, I'm really go for it. So, yeah, soapbox. Uh, so away. I'll, go with, I'll go with one. <laughs> the first one, which you've already mentioned, actually. Um is that many people think that with our gender, whatever your gender is, say you realise, right, okay, my gender doesn't match the one on my birth certificate. You can know that internally. You never have to tell anybody else, right? You never have to do anything with it. Or you can know and tell people, but you don't have to socially transition, which means um, changing your name, changing your pronouns, changing your dress. You don't have to do that, Um or you can do that. You can change your name, your pronouns, but you don't have to take hormones. Yeah. Or you can take hormones. You don't have to have surgery. Like there is no determined path, and you can change your path. So you might think you're over here in the spectrum for a few years, and then you might go, mm, you know what? This is about me exploring where I'm at. Maybe I'll go over here. Maybe I do want hormones now. So a lot of people who aren't in the community not everyone who's not in the community you have to be careful not to stereotype <laughs> um but don't understand naturally that we don't have to prove our gender yeah. so for example with me being gender queer right I express them okay that doesn't mean that I'm not gender queer yeah I don't have to prove to anyone I don't have to dress a certain way I don't have to act a certain way I don't have to change my name and I talk about this with my clients. I'm like, you don't decide my gender. Nobody outside me decides my gender, not even my wife. My yeah. gender is how I feel it. I don't have to do anything. And I've um, I've had some gender affirming surgeries mm-hmm. and people are like, oh, okay. So because, because of that, you're along this mm-hmm. journey. I'm like, no, actually, no. No, I had that surgery because I wanted to have that surgery and I yep. feel better, but it doesn't mean I then have to do this. I don't have to do that either. So I try to show you can move around mm-hmm. and it's this myth that, you know, we all have to have, we even have to present a certain way. So even if we have surgeries and hormones, all right, you have to look hyper thin, yeah, ultra masculine, or you have to, one of my clients said, so if I'm non-binary, do I have to dye my hair blue? <laughs> like, what? I love like, that blue I miss- the, is the um, automatic color. Yeah, I'm like, I've missed that on TikTok, obviously, because yeah. I don't watch TikTok. And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, you don't have to do that. No. So you it's can. trying blue to get people to sick. understand. <laughs> it does. But it's, yeah. it's, it's like, that doesn't mean you're non-binary. It's yeah. okay. You can look exactly the same. Yeah. And I know that outside the community, that would be confusing because you're like, oh, hang on a minute. How am I supposed to know? Mm-hmm. who's what yeah and, and you're not 
It's whether or not that person welcomes you into their gender. That is their choice. It's none of your business. So it's it's I'd love to explode that myth of there being yes. a certain way yep. to transition or not, or a certain way to prove you have to be a certain gender, or someone even um a psychiatrist mm. saying, Oh yes, I agree with you, you're this gender. Mm. They yeah. have a certain amount of power, but that still doesn't mean if they say, No, I don't agree with you. You you know you don't you're not gender diverse that so you go oh okay then no I'm not it, yeah that's not right yeah I so think that's, there that's is just this minute. really frustrating part of society that need it has feels the need for us all to fit a box or a list of classifications to check off that you know if you yeah fit the you know feminine spectrum that you know you wear dresses and you get your nails done and you get your hair done and you present in a feminine capacity and you know you don't wear jeans you like you don't wear pants all the time you know all that sort of let's just force everybody to fit into a box like that sort of like square yeah. peg round hole mentality like we just need you to fit because we need it to make sense to us and it doesn't need to make sense to you at all because this whole experience is rooted in flexibility and autonomy over self yeah so yep. you know we don't need to fit anything to to I love the um, we don't need to prove it. I love that. You know, it's just, no. it just is, it can just be, it doesn't need to be good, bad, ugly, right, wrong. It doesn't need to have a descriptive word. It just is. And it can just be, yeah. and just sit as, as that. So I love that. I'll join you in smashing the myth <laughs> because it's an, Thanks. it's a shit myth because it just, yes. you know, perpetuates uh, misinformation and it perpetuates, that societal discrimination that you sort of you know alluded to not too long ago but um yeah it's it's a, it's it's also dangerous in the community yeah so you will have people who are like i can't afford say laser yeah i, I can't afford facial feminization so that means that i'm not going to be in my opinion binary trans i'm not going to get to that point and that makes me feel like a failure yeah. And even in the community, people compete with each other. So people compete who looks more feminine or who looks more masculine and who's had, you know, what surgeries have you had and how long have you been on hormones? And wow, okay, well, you look great. I don't, I haven't reached that, you know, and it's, I feel shame. So there's yeah. already enough shame in the community. Absolutely. But then when we have these ideals from outside that we have to fit, and then on top of the pain of, gender dysphoria you've got the pain of oh I'm not even going to reach that because I don't have enough money to get to the ideal yeah and I think you know we forget that that societal discrimination is not just in the cisgender heterosexual community it is in our own backyards so to speak and you know for people to be able and we are getting into a whole nother topic but um you know, for people to be able to even access that medical support to be able to transition is a huge privilege. And, you know, there is great privilege that is attached to that because of the financial cost and because, you know, it is not um, covered by Medicare and, and things like that in Australia. And so it is a huge privilege for people to be able to to access that. And it is not something that is afforded yeah to a, a vast majority of people. So I think, yeah. you know, people forget that um, or don't want to acknowledge that privilege um, and it and it causes a lot of division both within and outside of the yeah. community, um, which is heartbreaking yeah. Um, yeah. for everybody involved. I'm going to ask yeah. you one last quick question and I'm going to put you on the spot because it wasn't one I gave you in, in advance. But what, you know, can us cisgender, you know, I'm obviously um, mm. married to a woman, bisexual, but mm. both of us are cisgender. What can we do as the community to support trans and gender diverse folk? What can we do? It's quite simple, really. Believe us. Yeah, amazing. Believe us. When we, te when we tell you this is our gender, believe yeah. it and respect it. 
Yeah. Right? Welcome us in. Don't push us out. Remember that we just want to live our life like you. Mm-hmm. It's like, leave us alone. Yeah. We, people say, you know, you're, you're shoving it down our throat. Well, we're actually standing up for human rights. You don't have to stand up for your human rights. Like every time my wife tries to use a public bathroom, we get discrimination. That's a human right. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I'm going to be in people's face about it because it's a human right. You don't have to fight for your human right to go to the bathroom. That would seem absurd for you. So, of course, I'm going to get in people's face. So believe believe us, Mm. welcome us, then leave us alone. Yeah. It's it's really not hard. (laughs) <laughs> I love that. I love it because oh. it is so simple and it's like, yeah, you know, I think we tend to think even people with, um, you know, diverse sexualities who don't fit, you know, the heterosexual image, I think even within that world there is just this, you know, it's very simple, just believe, respect and go away. I think you're right. I yeah. love that. I love the go away bit yeah. because, you know, we often talk about, uh, we often talk, you can tell I'm an introvert. I like the go away bit. Um, you know, it is it is that simple, you know, with everything. I think when it is an innate part of who we are, just believe and respect because, you know, yeah. and let us live our lives, I would imagine. Just let us go about yes. life the way that you get to go about your life. Yeah. Exactly. And it's simple and so many people can't do it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it is. It is. It's just, um, I mean, it's, we laugh because it's, you know, it just, if we don't laugh, we'll cry all the time. But, you know, there are people out there who are crying all the time because of it, because that's their that's their reality and that's their life. Yeah. Um, and they may not be personally getting discriminated against, as in, you know, they're not having insults hurled at them, but there is the societal discrimination that is still affecting them, the things that you see in the media and on social media and never, yeah. never go into a comment thread because, you know, you you will just see straight white men who are having way too many, yeah. way too many opinions than they deserve, quite frankly. Um, so it it is, I think, you know, it's yeah. heartbreaking um and just ridiculous. Ridiculous is the only word that is coming to mind yeah. in terms of just how yeah. simple it is, and yet there are people out there who can't manage it. Yeah, and people who escalate to a point that they want you dead. Yeah. And like, we've absolutely. had to move house twice because we've been attacked. Yeah. Right? So yeah. I understand this when my clients are talking to me and they know what I've been through. Yeah. And I'm like, I know how bad this can get. Yeah. And what happens is, like you just mentioned then, we have a community grief. Mm-hmm. So what will happen often when when someone um, is killed that's in the media or we get these rallies that we've had recently yes. where we're being publicly attacked, you end up with, a, like, I know that for me, I'll have days of feeling so heavy yeah. because there's, you feel the grief of the community where we're in distress, yeah. right? And I haven't seen that happen with another community. It's like, do you know what it's like walking around thinking that people want you dead and they don't even know who you are? And these, this is a big fear for the people who come into my sessions and know they're trans and they're like, is this the life that I'm going to have yeah. where there are people out there who might want to kill me? And I'm like, uh, yes, they're a very small proportion. They may come never, never come anywhere near you, but I'm not going to tell you they're not there. Yeah. So that's where you go when people bang on about it being a choice. It's like, why would you, why would you choose no. this? Yeah. Absolutely. I've had, uh, I've even said that um, myself about, you know, marrying my wife was, was not an easy process by any means. And, Mm. you know, there was lost community and lost friends and, you know, just difficulty in even finding vendors and things like that for our wedding. And so you sort of do sit down and go, why Mm. would anybody choose that path? Because, you know, society makes it so difficult. Why would somebody yeah. choose that path? Um, yeah. And so, yeah, 
I feel like I could talk for hours with you about it, but we don't mm-hmm. have hours, unfortunately. Um, but I think that that's a really wonderful intro, I guess, for people to um, to what it looks like in the therapy room. And I think really to understand that there is nothing that is off limits. I think that's <laughs> um, the takeaway. Uh, nothing off limits. You'll hear all no. of the stories. <laughs> All yes. of the lingo, all of the nitty gritty things that that go on, yeah. and I think that that's the the biggest takeaway for for people in that community mm. is there is Thank a place you. for you in therapy. There is a space for you, yeah. and and it's safe and it's affirming, and um, yeah. that there is nothing off limits. Mm. So I think that's the important bit. But thank you. Thank you. It has been wonderful chatting. Um, and, Pleasure. Um, thank you. And I hope that that it lands in the ears of people who need to hear it. I think that's thank you. That's my hope. Thanks, Tasha. Yeah, I know. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed joining us inside the therapy room. Thanks for listening. 